Nitin Bajaj is the manager of Fidelity Asian Values PLC, and he joins me now. Uh, Nitin, what's the investment philosophy behind this investment trust? The philosophy behind the trust is to look for interesting companies across Asia and try and find them at reasonable prices. It's bringing the way you invest in your private life to the stock market. So if you had $10 million and you were going and buying private companies today, what do you want to buy? You want to buy good companies run by people you can trust at reasonable prices. I want to do the same in the stock market. The beauty is that you have more than 15,000 listed companies in Asia and it gives an investor like me and with a research network like Fidelity a lot of choice to go and find the gems of tomorrow and buy them before other investors discover them. And how big is the opportunity set out there in Asia? Number of companies, 15,000 listed companies in Asia, more than 15,000 listed companies in Asia. A lot of them would be uninvestable because either they don't trade or there's corporate governance issues. But I would say the investable set would be more than three or 4,000 still. So there's a lot of companies listed in Asia. You know, when we sit here in London, we think um, Asia's one place. Asia's huge. Uh, you have 4,000 companies listed just in India, another 4,000 listed just in China. So these are big geographies with a lot of economic potential and a lot of small medium companies listed there. Does your definition of Asia include Australia? Australia is a part of Asia Pacific and a lot of Australian companies do business in Asia. So yes, I do invest in Australian companies. So how do you go about deciding which stocks to invest in? The way I think about investing in stocks is actually I don't have an interest in stocks. My primary interest is the business. Why does the company exist? Who's the customer? Why does the customer buy the product? What other product can he buy instead of this product? Who's the competition? How can the competition hurt the business? You know, I'll take an example. If I was to go and buy Colgate India, which is a listed company in India, whether I make money or lose money with this business over the next five years will largely be driven by how does the toothpaste market in India evolve? And within that, how does Colgate do versus Unilever, Procter & Dabur, which is the competition? Why do 50% of Indians get up every single morning and use Colgate? For many, many, many years, half the Indians get up every morning and use Colgate. Why? Is it the brand? Is it the product? Is it the R&D? Is it the sales network? Is it the global parentage? What allows them to dominate the market? Till I don't answer that question, I don't think I can value the business. If I cannot value the business, I cannot compare it to the price in the stock market. If I cannot compare price with value, then you're not investing, you're speculating. And I have no interest in speculation. So the process of investing is understand the business. Second, figure out whether the price is your friend or your enemy. So value the business. Compare it with the price in the stock market and invest when value far exceeds the price. Why does the investment trust structure work for this particular mandate? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find all these little gems which will be big companies tomorrow. But at the moment they could be illiquid stocks in the stock market. They may not trade too much. And an investment trust gives you privileged capital. It is capital which doesn't go out tomorrow. You have capital for the long term. And given my investment style where I'm trying to own businesses rather than rent stocks from the market, Long-term capital allows me to take a longer-term view on these businesses and I can hold them as, as they grow bigger and bigger. So is illiquidity a particular risk for you in this portfolio? Illiquidity is always a risk for any investor, but it's also an opportunity. So the way I try to manage illiquidity is that when you're investing in small companies, you're bound to take single stock liquidity risk. How you manage that is you keep the total portfolio liquid. And the way you keep the total portfolio liquid is you own certain percentage in large cap stocks, which are also good investments on their own, but they allow you to take advantage of certain market movements where some small caps may fall and then you can put some money from large caps into small caps. Why are you running a value approach in what's seen very much as a growth market? The simple answer of why value investing in Asia is because you make money. Now, that's the fact. Value outperforms growth in Asia. Value outperforms growth in almost every market in the world. The intellectual justification of that is basically value outperforms growth because capitalism works. 
the, it's the basis of capitalism. How capitalism works is that when an industry is growing well or when a sector is growing well, it attracts capital and it attracts talent. When capital and talent enter a sector, competition goes up. When competition goes up, the returns go down, margins go down, profits go down, stocks go down. The exact opposite happens in industries which are doing badly, which are so-called value stocks. Industries doing badly will see capital and talent leave the industry. When capital and talent leave the industry, competition goes down. When competition goes down, returns go up. When returns go up, profits go up. When profits go up, stocks go up. Uh, so it's, it's just the system of capitalism. I don't know a single student coming out of a university today and saying, I want to start a cigarette company. It's seen as a dead industry. And hence, all the cigarette companies make very high profit margins because there's no incremental competition. I know a lot of graduates coming out of college and saying, I want to start a technology company or I want to start a biotech company. So you see a lot of capital and talent flowing into these industries and competition will go up and returns will come down. What can investors expect from the Fidelity Asian Values portfolio? So my investment process is whenever I look at a company, I'm trying to figure out can I make 50% returns over the next three years, which is roughly 15% per annum. Uh, and that's the target return I take for every stock that I invest in. I invest in an eclectic set of companies and I'm investing it as I would invest in a private, with my private capital. So hopefully the portfolio should behave quite differently from the stock market because I'm not really looking at the stock market to invest in these companies. I'm taking one business at a time, analyze it, see if it makes a good investment figure out if I can make 50% over the next three years. If I can, I make an investment. If I can't, I will pass on it. What would you say are the biggest risks in this investment trust and how do you look to contain them? I think the first risk in any kind of investment fund is the arrogance of the fund manager because you have periods of good performance and uh, hubris sets in and you get arrogant and you start to make mistakes. Second is you have to fight your own psychology as an investor because we all have cognitive dissonance. We all like to think that the way we do things is the best way. But uh, in the stock market, doing that is very dangerous. So you have to constantly try and improve your process, become better and better. Uh, so I think the biggest risks with any investment fund, not only this one, is always is the investment team who's managing the fund continuing to work hard or not. So how do you look to counter those negative traits you were mentioning there? I think being aware of these risks is halfway there already. Uh, and then um, you surround yourself with people, which is my boss, who are constantly questioning, even during good times, decisions that we make. Um, and it keeps me on my toes. You took on Fidelity Asian Values in April 2015. What's your previous experience of running Asian equities? I find it no different uh, than having done this job in Europe. So I was, I was uh, investing money in Europe for a long time. And I've managed our India funds for three years before running the Asian, Asian funds. And the job is always the same. Finding good companies run by people you can trust at reasonable prices. Is 2015 a good time to be buying Asian equities? It's always a good time to invest and it's never a good time to invest because you're basically asking me if I can tell you what's going to happen in 2015. Um, and like Buffett always says, a forecast tells you more about the forecaster than the future. So I think um, there's lots of pundits out there who have a view on what's going to happen happen in the world this year or happen in Asia this year. Um, I don't tend to think like that because I'm not trying to rent stocks from the stock market for the next six months. I'm trying to, business, I'm trying to buy businesses for the next three to five years at reasonable prices run by people I can trust. So I am actually quite ambivalent whether the stock market is going to be up or down this year till the time the businesses I own continue to do what they're supposed to do. Nitin Bajaj, thank you very much. Thank you.